Now, what would Earth look like if it was the only planet in the solar system? Or, what would happen to our planet if the moon went missing? Or, what if dinosaurs had never gone extinct? We've all heard the story. Over 66 million years ago, a big asteroid hit Earth. Almost 75% of creatures that roamed the planet at the time were wiped out in mass extinction. Among them, dinosaurs. Tyrannosaurus, Triceratops, Velociraptor, all gone. But because of that, we're all alive. According to science, the human race was developing more safely without these gigantic creatures hunting us. But what if that asteroid had crashed to the ground a few miles away from the place where it fell? What would the world be like today? Imagine walking down the street to your local supermarket and coming across a truck-sized T-Rex. Could that ever happen in this alternate universe we're talking about? Well, dinosaurs would have had to survive a lot more than an asteroid to be living nowadays. About 55 million years ago, the temperatures on the planet rose. The climate became 14 degrees Fahrenheit hotter than it is today. Rainforests flourished, and vegetation was abundant. In this scenario, herbivore dinosaurs would have likely thrived. But they would have started to look a bit different. Plants started growing during that time period were not very rich in nutrients. This means that dinosaurs would have probably shrunk in size, not having the necessary energy to grow all the way to their full size. Then, about 34 million years ago, South America and Antarctica split, which resulted in a cooler and drier climate. During this period, long-legged dinosaurs would have been the ones to survive. At that time, animals had to travel long distances to hunt, since seasons started to affect the availability of food and water. Compared to the mammals of that period, dinosaurs would have had significant advantages, like having more teeth or better eyesight. And speaking of mammals, some of them probably would have never evolved. That would have become dinosaurs' breakfast first. By the way, did you know that some dinosaurs live among us today? Think pigeons, or birds in general. They've all evolved from dinosaurs. Now I bet you've heard once or twice that we use 10% of our brains. If this was true, what would happen if you used 100% of our brain? Would you be able to compose a symphony? Would you become a tech genius and create a multi-million dollar company overnight? Let's start with the facts. We don't only use 10% of our brain. This notion became highly popularized by movies, but it's not very accurate. The truth is, the largest portion of your brain is active at all times. But not all parts are working simultaneously. The exact percentage varies from person to person. Now, neurologists say you wouldn't be using 100% of your brain's capacity at once. Your body simply wouldn't have enough energy for that, which means you'd be hungry all the time. Imagine the number of calories you'd need to consume for that to work. You would also be limited by your body's basic needs, breathing, digesting food, and circulating blood. So if you did use all of the capacity of your brain, you'd be tired all the time. It'd be worse than running a marathon without any preparation. The brain would need all the blood you'd have, which would mean less oxygen for your lungs. Different organs would begin to shut down one by one. In a nutshell, it'd be terrible for your health. By the way, some researchers have estimated that more than 60% of the brain is composed of something that is called neural dark matter. In other words, this dark matter consists of neurons that have no apparent purpose or simply don't respond to common stimuli. Marathons are some of the greatest feats of strength and endurance in the world. But what would happen to your body if you decided to run a marathon without any training? The statistics are overwhelming. Nearly 50% of participants drop out of the race before crossing the finish line. A regular marathon is 26 miles long. And if you're not used to physical activity, it's a great challenge. You'd probably be able to run the first mile without any serious problems, but breathing loudly and heavily through your mouth. By the third mile, your body temperature would skyrocket, and you'd feel as if you have a mild fever. You'd most likely give up here, but if you decided to keep going, you'd have to trick your mind and body into running another 23 miles. By the 20th mile, you'd hit what is known as the wall. 
your body would have burned all your reserves of glucose and you'd get extremely tired. Even experienced runners often go through this stage. By the end of the marathon, you'd be promising yourself to never do this again. You'd leave the race with at least a few cramps and many food cravings. Now picture this, it's a clear, beautiful night. There are no clouds and you can see two of the brightest planets in Earth's sky blinking up there. Those are Mars and Venus. Now have you ever imagined what would happen if Earth was the only planet in the solar system? If the other planets never existed, things would be really different for our Earth. The planets in the solar system work together, keeping one another in certain place with their gravitational pull. Now, if Mercury or Venus ceased to exist, Earth would drift closer to the Sun. Our atmospheric temperature would become similar to that on the surface of Mercury. 800 degrees Fahrenheit. This would make life on Earth impossible. But if Jupiter or Saturn disappeared, Earth would most likely drift further away from the Sun, and its temperature would drop to below negative 200 degrees Fahrenheit. If life managed to survive in such circumstances, it would probably be aquatic. The position of Earth in the solar system not only affects all kinds of life forms, but it also dictates seasons, the length of days, and how long one year lasts. Now, when we say no other planets, we mean no moons either. So, what would happen if one fine day, the moon just disappeared? That would have catastrophic consequences. The moon has the largest influence on Earth's tides. In a moonless universe, tides would shrink by about 75%. This would greatly affect crabs, mussels, and sea snails that live in tidal zones. This would consequently disrupt the diet of larger animals. Eventually, it would affect entire coastal ecosystems. Earth's weather would change. Tides and tidal currents help mix cold Arctic water with warmer water from the tropics, stabilizing the climate worldwide. Weather forecasting would become almost impossible, and the average difference between the hottest and coldest places on Earth would become extreme. The absence of the moon would also influence Earth's tilt. Right now, Earth tilts on its axis at 23.5 degrees, mostly due to the moon's gravity. With no moon around, Earth's axis would wobble between 10 to 45 degrees. Scientists believe that even a slight difference in Earth's tilt can cause huge changes, such as an ice age. Other than this, a moonless sky would upend the lives of many nocturnal animals. Moths have evolved to navigate using the light of the moon and stars. Newborn baby turtles use the moon's light to find their way to the ocean. Different animals rely on both darkness and a small amount of moonlight to hunt effectively. Now how about we travel far back in time and imagine what would happen if you lived in ancient Egypt. This civilization lasted for over 3,000 years. Ancient Egyptians were responsible for building some of the world's most recognizable symbols, the Great Pyramids at Giza. If you'd lived in ancient Egypt, you'd have witnessed a time of enormous scientific and mathematical breakthroughs. Ancient Egyptians organized themselves in strict social structures, so you'd probably have to fit into one of them. You'd have either been born a laborer, a farmer, or a specialist, which was either a soldier, a sailor, or a teacher. Or you'd have been part of the Egyptian elite. If you had been a farmer, you'd probably live in a house made of mud bricks. You'd have had a stone oven and kept your food stored in a pit in the ground. You'd have spent your days tending to crop fields by the Nile River, or taking care of cattle and ducks. On tax days, you'd have packed up some of your harvest and brought it to the temple as payment for the usage of land. If you'd been a member of the elite, you'd have spent most of your days in banquets. You would have adorned yourself in gold and semi-precious stones, displaying all your wealth. If you had lived in ancient Egypt, maybe you would have been one of those who invented tables. Yep, before the Egyptians, there was no such thing as a table. This invention appeared as a way to keep food off the ground. It's dark outside, almost 2 a.m. You go outside and look at the sky, and here it is, bright, full moon. You might think you know a lot about Earth's natural satellite, but let me ask you this, how did it form? The answer is, nobody knows, but of course, there are theories. 
The most popular one, called the Giant Impact Theory, claims that the moon formed during a collision between Earth and another planet. This planet must have been smaller than ours, the size of Mars, and the collision itself probably happened around 4.5 billion years ago. Another theory, called the Capture Theory, claims that the moon used to be an asteroid or some other wandering body. It formed somewhere else in the solar system. When it was passing by Earth, it got caught by our planet's gravity. But here is one catch. Our planet and the moon have remarkable isotopic and chemical similarities. So, they must have a linked history, which means the moon couldn't have been created elsewhere. Other experts think that at some point in the past, Earth was spinning so fast that some of its material broke away. It soon started to orbit our planet. That's how the moon appeared in the sky. But again, there's one problem. In this case, the proportion and type of minerals on the moon would have to be the same as on Earth. But there are slight differences. The moon is richer in materials that form very fast at high temperatures. There's one more theory, and it's probably the least exciting. It claims that Earth's natural satellite could simply appear along with Earth during our planet's formation. Duh! But these days, a more urgent question keeps astronomers busy. Is the moon really Earth's satellite? Or are these two twin planets? The moon is big compared to our planet, about one quarter of Earth's size. That's why some experts refer to our planetary system as a double planet. But how correct is that? If we want to figure it out, we need to give the definition to the word planet. According to the International Astronomical Union, a planet is a space body that orbits the sun, is massive enough to have a nearly round shape thanks to its gravity, and has cleared the region around its orbit. Now, what about a satellite? It's an object in space that orbits around a larger celestial body. If we take the system Earth the Moon, its center of gravity, called a barycenter, is inside the Earth. That's why at the moment we can't say that we live in a twin planet system. According to this definition, the Moon is the satellite of our planet. Now, let's get back to the past, like 3 or 4 billion years ago. Even though the Moon wasn't a planet, it most likely had a full-fledged atmosphere. It formed at times when powerful volcanic eruptions were rocking our satellite. Gases spread all over the Moon's surface, and it happened so fast that they didn't have enough time to escape into space. At that time, the lunar surface was covered with basins filled with volcanic basalt. Just imagine ginormous plumes of magma hurtling high into the air, falling to the ground and creating lava flows. That's how the basalt basins appeared on the surface of the Moon. At one point, scientists got their hands on samples brought from the Moon. They found out that lava flows there contained not only carbon monoxide and sulfur, but also the building blocks of water. Thanks to these samples, researchers managed to calculate the amount of gas that rose and formed the atmosphere. It became the thickest around 3.5 billion years ago and existed for about 70 million years. After that, poof! The atmosphere was lost in space. But the coolest thing? When the Moon did have an atmosphere, the satellite was 3 to 10 times closer to our planet. One computer simulation even suggests the Moon was probably up to 19 times closer than it is now. The distance between it and our planet could be 18,600 miles. While these days, our satellite is around 240,000 miles away. That's why the Moon looked much, much bigger in the sky. Unfortunately, at that time, not even dinos were around to admire the view. These days, the atmosphere of the Moon is almost non-existent, and that's why the satellite can't protect itself from meteorites. The surface of the Moon is dotted with craters. For comparison, there are about 190 identified impact craters on our planet. Many of them are hidden by vegetation or covered with water. But if we speak about the Moon, the number is so much greater, several million, and around 5,000 of them are more than 12 miles across. And since the Moon is less seismically active than Earth, these craters and other ancient formations stay in perfect condition for centuries. When you look at the Moon, 
It's the brightest object in the night sky. But in reality, its surface is dark because the reflectance of our natural satellite is just a bit higher than that of asphalt. You might know that the moon's gravitational pull causes tides on our planet, making the oceans bulge out on both the side closest to the moon and the one farthest from the satellite. But that's not all. The moon also slows down Earth's rotation. This phenomenon is known as tidal breaking. It increases the length of a day on Earth by a bit more than 2 milliseconds per 100 years. The moon is also moving away from Earth at the same rate at which your fingernails grow. That's about 1.5 inches per year. If one day the moon floats away into space, our planet will have to live through tough times. Without the stabilizing pull of the moon's gravity, Earth's tilt would start changing wildly from no tilt at all, meaning no seasons, to a large tilt, resulting in extreme weather. Even though the moon's surface is mostly dormant, Earth's natural satellite still experiences moonquakes. One theory suggests that they may be happening because the moon is shrinking as its insides are cooling. Scientists say that the moon has become around 150 feet skinnier than it used to be several hundred million years ago. To help you understand it, picture a grape turning into a raisin, it wrinkles while shrinking. The same is happening to the moon. It's shrinking and it's wrinkling. But unlike the grape, the moon doesn't have flexible skin. Its surface is hard and brittle. So as the moon gets smaller, the crust cracks and breaks, and its sections get pushed over neighboring parts. Want to know another cool thing about the moon? A recent study claims that it has a tail and every month it wraps around our planet like a scarf. This slender tail is made up of millions of atoms of sodium, and our planet regularly travels directly through it. Meteor strikes blast these sodium atoms out of the moon's surface and further into space. For several days every month, the moon remains between the sun and our planet. That's when Earth's gravity picks that sodium tail. Our planet drags it into a long stripe that wraps around its atmosphere. This lunar tail is totally harmless. It's also invisible to the human eye, 50 times dimmer than what you can perceive. But during those rare days, high-powered telescopes can spot its faint yellowish glow in the sky. The tail looks like a gleaming spot that's five times the full moon's diameter. And the spiciest fact for you, Two or three years ago, an asteroid was pulled into Earth's orbit and started to travel around the planet. Even though it was no larger than an average car, it was still a big deal. Out of more than one million asteroids astronomers know about, it was only the second one to orbit our planet, called 2020 CD3. It was our temporary mini-moon. It didn't stay with Earth for long, though. The asteroid followed a random orbit and slowly drifted away. Temporarily captured objects such as 2020 CD3 are rare. They need to have a specific direction and speed to be caught by Earth's gravitational pull. Otherwise, they either crash into the planet or fly in another direction. It all started with a minor change on our planet. At first, people noticed the moon had become brighter and a little bigger. But nobody paid attention to this. The moon affected tides all over the world. The water flooded the beaches, but it wasn't a tragedy. A lot of fish came close to the shores. People found giant squid, anglerfish, and other creatures next to the coast, although they usually live in the dark depths. New, stranger things happen every day. Birds no longer fly to the south in winter. They gather in huge groups flying around cities with no purpose. The moon used to help them navigate in nature so they can't figure out which way to fly anymore. In the boundless waters of the world's oceans, ship captains notice that compasses are now unstable. The arrow is pointing in different directions since the Earth's magnetic poles have changed. People realize the moon has started to approach Earth for an unknown reason. The moon's gravity affects the gravity of our planet. This entails changes in the climate the behavior of all living beings, and the magnetic field. Now, it rains in the driest places and gets hot in the coldest lands. It's knocking down ecosystems all over the planet. 
people living near forests hear wolves howling all the time. The moon drives these animals mad. The Earth's natural satellite is growing in size and lights up the night much brighter. Nothing critical has happened yet. People don't panic because they don't want to believe the end is coming. But then, one day, the moon reaches a critical point. You're walking down the street, listening to music. And, at that moment, someone pushes you. Okay, maybe that guy is late for work. You keep walking, and a girl coming by hits your shoulder. I'm sorry, she says, and goes away. You've noticed the fear in her eyes. You look ahead and see people running towards you. You take off your headphones and hear screams and sirens. People leave their cars and run away. Hundreds of seagulls are flying in the sky. You hear a strange noise among all the sounds of chaos. It seems to be water. How is this possible? You're in the city center, a few miles from the shore. But there's no time to think. You notice a huge wave flooding the streets and heading straight to you. You run into a building and go up to the 10th floor. From here, you're watching the water filling the city. The strong stream blows all cars, one-story buildings, and trees off the road. You notice a shark and other fish in the water. People are hiding in houses and on the roofs. The whole city is quickly plunging into a catastrophe. The TV is working in the building where you're hiding. You learn that floods are occurring all over the world. Massive tsunamis cover coastal cities. In some places, waves reach the height of a 30-story building. Many towns have been washed off the face of the Earth. The moon is too close to Earth, and massive floods are just the beginning. The moon flies around Earth and helps to keep our home on its axis. The moon provides climate stability and helps living organisms develop. But now, this balance is broken. The moon is approaching and changing our planet's gravity. Earth can tilt slightly to the side and provoke massive floods around the world. Imagine that you're holding a round glass of water. Tilt it a little. See how the liquid moves from one side to another? The same thing is happening now with the oceans. But the moon is not just approaching us. It's flying around the planet and getting closer with each circle. It causes natural disasters in different locations on Earth all the time. Now the ocean floods one side, and a few hours later, another. So you see all the water going back from the streets to the shore. The oceans may return to the city again by the end of the day. Wait a minute. It seems the end of the day has already come. You notice that the sky has become dark. It's weird, because it's only 3 p.m. The moon changes Earth's rotation speed and makes the day go faster. The moon covers almost the entire sky and brightly illuminates our planet. You see huge lunar craters. It's so close that you can still see it even when the sun shines. In some places, the passing moon obscures the sun. The water is leaving the streets and everyone goes outside. At this moment, an earthquake begins. The road is cracking and the houses are collapsing. There are landslides on the street. Tectonic plates are shifting all over the planet. Imagine two magnetic balls that are approaching each other. So, one ball is the moon and the second one is Earth's core. What do you think will happen to what's above the core? That's hundreds of thousands of miles of the Earth's crust. And now, it's all moving. Destructive cracks are emerging all over the world. The planet's highest mountains break down and turn into a pile of stones. The seabed cracks and releases magma from the underground depths. Volcanoes wake up and erupt magma. Clouds of volcanic ash cover the sky from the sun and the glowing moon. But the scariest thing is still ahead. A collision is inevitable. The moon flies around the planet like a ball in a round glass with a hole in the center. This force drives clouds all over the planet. Now there's a thunderstorm, but in five minutes, it will be snowing. Then the night comes and it starts raining. Water droplets consist of mud and volcanic ash. It's difficult for people to breathe without gas masks. Atmospheric pressure is constantly changing. Some people experience severe migraines and some have sore joints. But there's no time to think about your health. Humanity needs to figure out how to save itself from the collision. 
a new gravitational order will come when the moon crashes into Earth. Continents will change their shape. They will combine into one giant piece of land or split into a hundred smaller ones. The energy of the collision can burn all the oxygen in the atmosphere and make the planet unsuitable for life. Hiding underground also makes no sense because of deep earthquakes. People decide to spend their last hours with loved ones and their families. The moon is getting closer. It's now at the same distance as the International Space Station. The moon covers the sky. Many cities are in the shadows because of the waves. Tsunamis, several miles in height, crash down on the ground. Millions of tons of magma collide with the ocean. Billions of gallons of water just evaporate. Moisture rises into the air, mixes with ash, and floods the land in the form of giant cumulus clouds. You've accepted the complete destruction of the planet. But something strange happens to the moon at this moment. You notice giant cracks appear on it. The moon slowly begins to divide into two parts. Both halves crumble into hundreds of large pieces. It's just falling apart. The Earth doesn't have a natural satellite anymore. It's just a pile of giant space rocks. But why is this happening? There's a space around our planet called the Roche Limit. In this place, the gravity of Earth is stronger than that of the moon. This means that the forces holding the moon together are weaker than those that tear it apart. People are cheering. The Roche Limit has saved the planet. The moon won't hit us. It breaks up into millions of fragments and forms a circle around our globe. Now, Earth looks like Saturn. A belt of moonstones surrounds us. Huge chunks destroy everything in their path, all the space debris. The satellites are no longer working. Humanity loses its means of communication and navigation. People will have to use paper maps again. The moon held our planet's orbit at a certain angle before these events. Now the axis is tilted differently. One hemisphere becomes closer to the sun, and the other plunges into shadow. The North Pole and the Arctic may turn into hot deserts, and the equator of the planet may be covered with ice. Winter and summer can last for years. The moon's remnants fly around Earth, but some of them fall on our planet. Lunar meteor showers destroy cities and create giant craters. All these events lead to the massive destruction of life on Earth. It will take hundreds of thousands of years to adapt to the new world. The Moon, a beautiful natural satellite with some mysterious dark splotches. We always see only one side of it, so we're used to this image. It's hard to imagine the Moon looking any other way. But it used to be different. Oh ho ho, it used to be so different. Picture this, a huge incandescent satellite in the sky that is causing constant tsunamis. I suggest we go very far into the past to see what the moon was like many, many years ago. The moon formed around 4.5 billion years ago. At that time, our green-blue planet was still a red-hot, insanely unstable piece of rock flying in space. We didn't have the moon yet, and a day on our planet only lasted six hours, which meant only three hours of daylight. Volcanoes erupted all over the place, releasing poisonous gas into the air, and a bunch of meteorites regularly crashed into the planet. At the same time, 4.5 billion years ago, the so-called Big Splash occurred, or as scientists call it, the Giant Impact Hypothesis. It claims that once an object the size of Mars crashed into Earth. Mars is about two times as small as our planet, so the blow wasn't too bad, but it was quite catastrophic. This powerful impact tore off part of the outer layers of that Mars-sized object and Earth. The very core of this space body merged with Earth's own dense core, and a huge number of fragments of Earth flew into outer space. So, this was the beginning of our moon, or, saying in a scientific way, the process of differentiation has begun. This is the process all planetary bodies go through at the beginning of their lives. Since the impact was very hot, its heat carried away most of the gases and liquids from the broken pieces of Earth. Only a relatively dry stone surface remained. So yeah, there is water and gases on the Moon, but in very small quantities. 
The gravity of our planet was strong enough to make all these hot stone fragments stay in its orbit, and they gradually began to stick together. The chemicals they contained were distributed in layers. Iron, which was heavier, sank deeper inside, and lighter elements formed the surface. In a short time, a hundred years or less, the ring of steam, dust, and molten rock fused together. The largest clusters with the strongest gravity attracted more and more particles, gradually forming the moon. It looked like a red-hot bubble ball. Sadly, the nucleus of this newborn moon turned out to be very small. It lacked iron and other heavy elements to form into something substantial, like a planet. The oldest rocks of the moon probably formed in the ocean of magma. And when the moon gradually cooled down, it turned out to be a white, clean, and perfectly even ball. But it was still completely different from what we have now. To begin with, immediately after its birth, the satellite was located at a distance of only 13,500 miles away from Earth. This is 15 times closer than it is now, around 238,000 miles. It's scary to imagine how huge and bright the moon looked in the sky at that moment. The view was probably both beautiful and terrifying. And, of course, such proximity caused incredibly huge waves on Earth. The planet experienced regular tsunamis. Also, at that time, the moon was spinning very fast, and it wasn't turned to Earth with only one side. But, in general, Earth and the moon had a positive impact on each other. For example, it was the moon that made our day last 24 hours. Now, Earth's axis is mostly tilted 23.5 degrees from the plane of its orbit around the Sun. Without the moon, Earth rotated rapidly. But thanks to the satellite, the planet's tilt stabilized, which led to a wide and pleasant variety of climates on Earth. To be fair, the gravity of our planet also helped the moon. Thanks to it, the moon began to rotate more and more slowly while gradually moving away from us. Over the years, its orbit has moved far away from our planet. At the same time, the moon became tidally locked to Earth. This means that its rotation period coincides with its orbital period. Or, in other words, the moon moves around itself as fast as it moves around the Earth. That's why the moon always faces our planet with only one side. When the moon moved away, tides on Earth became calmer. Now, water could flow to the most remote corners of our planet. It was then that life appeared on Earth. But back to the evolution of the moon itself. What was happening on its surface after its formation? The next stages of the moon's development were childhood and adolescence. And as is usually the case at this stage, this period was insane. No wonder! About 4 billion years ago, the solar system was going crazy. During the first 600 million years of the moon's existence, large asteroids and comets constantly collided with it. Now, they were bothering not only our Earth, but also its satellite. These impacts were the most powerful in the history of the moon. They left many large craters, which were later filled with dark rock. So, Earth wasn't enough for you, huh, space? Once, a dwarf planet crashed into the moon. It was about the size of Ceres, the largest object in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. This explosion formed the SPA basin and also forever changed the appearance of the moon. Can you see that dark spot on the far side of the moon? Right there in this very south? This spot is called the South Pole Aitken Basin. Its diameter is about 1,600 miles. And yes, it was formed by the impact I've mentioned about 4.3 billion years ago. This planet brought with it a bunch of complex and strange chemical compounds that scientists are now finding all over the far surface of the moon. These compounds began to emit a lot of heat, melted part of the lunar mantle, and, oops, accidentally woke up volcanoes. The volcanoes began to erupt furiously. A huge amount of magma was distributed over the surface of the moon. Many years later, it cooled down, leaving behind those famous dark splotches that we're so used to. They're called the Lunar Maria. There are much fewer craters there than on the lunar highlands. But for the last billion years, the moon has been geologically inactive, except for occasional collisions with meteorites. 
In general, the appearance of the moon changed forever as a result of these events, and, battered and tired, it entered adulthood. But even then, it couldn't get any peace. A bunch of meteorites decided to bother it again. Honestly, it wasn't that bad. There were many collisions, but all of them were quite small. They just left a bunch of craters and pits on the moon and maybe damaged its mantle a little. Some of the collisions deepened already existing large craters. The moon's crust was getting thinner and thinner over the years because of all the chaos going on. And now we call this upper part of the lunar crust covered with craters the lunar highlands. All those white and bright areas of the moon? The highlands. But in the end, the universe finally calmed down for now at least, and the moon began to look the way it does today. There are still many things we don't know about Earth's natural satellite. There are moments in its history that scientists still can't accurately explain, but they're continuing to study our beautiful satellite. The data about the moon is useful to people not only for its own sake, it gives us a more complete picture of both the history of our solar system and space as a whole. So, let's hope that one day, we'll be able to find out everything there is to know about the moon. Do you know that these days, our planet has not one, but several moons? Well, kind of. Astronomers have recently discovered another moon orbiting Earth. But it's not what you might be imagining. It's actually an asteroid trailing along beside our planet in a complex semi-orbit. The asteroid was named 2023 FW13, and instead of simply orbiting our planet like the moon does, it orbits the sun. But its orbit is so unusual that it causes the asteroid to circle Earth too, keeping it in roughly the same area as our planet, even though it doesn't orbit it directly. You've probably already realized that 2023 FW13 isn't the kind of moon where we could send a mission. It's way smaller and farther away than our natural satellite. The newly found space object is a mere 50 feet across and is floating 9 million miles away, and that's when it's the closest to Earth. This distance is around 35 times as great as that between our planet and the Moon. On the other hand, cosmically speaking, it's just next door. For the first time, the quasi-Moon was spotted by astronomers at the Pan-STARRS Observatory on Haleakala in Hawaii in March 2023. Now, a quasi-moon is a space object which shares a similar orbital path with a planet, even though it doesn't orbit this planet directly. Plus, it has a steady relative position to this planet. True moons always keep a relatively consistent distance from their parent planet, but quasi-moons have more complex paths. That's because of the combined gravitational influences of the Sun and the planet itself. Quasi-moons usually have horseshoe or tadpole-like orbits. To put it simply, you can see them travel ahead or behind a planet when it orbits the Sun. Such an orbit is truly unusual, and it occurs because the gravitational pull between the Sun, the planet, and the quasi-moon results in a complex dynamic, leading to a delicate balance in the trajectory of the quasi-moon. When a quasi-moon moves ahead of a planet, it tends to slow down with time, and in the end it falls behind because of the gravitational influence of the planet. Similarly, when a quasi-moon falls behind at first, it later starts speeding up and begins to move ahead of the planet. This is what creates that horseshoe shape if you look at this dance from a fixed point in space. At the same time, the orbit will look like a tadpole from the perspective of the planet. Scientists love quasi-moons because they present great research possibilities. Their interesting orbits make them perfect for studying gravitational influences and the intricacies of space mechanics. Plus, they're usually close to their parent planets, which can also offer insights into the formation and evolution of planetary systems. And who knows, maybe at one point in the future, they'll help us with space exploration. Missions to such quasi-moons could give us important information about different celestial bodies and help with the exploration of the solar system. But let's get back to our tiny moon. While it's still being studied, Current data suggests that 2023 FW13 entered its current orbit at least 2,100 years ago. And according to simulations based on preliminary orbital calculations, the quasi-moon will accompany Earth for another 1,700 years or so. 
The good news is that the asteroid won't end up on a collision course with Earth, despite traveling relatively close to our planet. A few years ago, another asteroid was pulled into Earth's orbit and started to travel along with our planet. No larger than an average car, it was still a big deal. Out of more than 1 million asteroids astronomers know about, it was only the second one to orbit our planet. Called 2020 CD3, it became our temporary mini-moon. It wasn't going to stay with Earth for long, though. The asteroid is following a random orbit and is slowly drifting away. 2020 CD3 will make another close pass to Earth in March 2044, though it will most likely not be caught by Earth again because of the greater approach distance. Temporarily captured objects, such as this one, are rare. They need to have a specific direction and speed to be captured by Earth's gravitational pull. Otherwise, they either crash into the planet or fly in another direction. And in 2016, astronomers discovered another space rock and called it Kamo'oalewa. There was one absolutely amazing thing about this space traveler. Astronomers suspect that this celestial body could have formed after splitting off the moon during an ancient collision with an asteroid. Yes, it means it might be a piece of our moon. When specialists examined the space body and analyzed its composition, the results didn't match any of the more than 2,000 near-Earth asteroids studied before. Kamo'oalewa was too tiny and too far away for regular telescopes to study it. That's why the researchers had to find a more powerful telescope to learn more about this unusual find. After using the Large Binocular Telescope, one of the largest optical telescopes in America, and the Infrared Lowell Discovery Telescope, the scientists finally figured out what the asteroid was made of, and what they had discovered surprised them. The asteroid had light spectra similar to those of the samples of lunar material delivered to Earth by the 1960s and 1970s Apollo missions. Astronomers admit that there might be other asteroids with the same spectra, but so far, they haven't found anything like that. Kamaoalewa is another quasi-satellite of our planet. Its orbit is a bit tilted and slightly elongated. So the rock keeps leaping ahead and then falling behind Earth. In other words, it performs constant loops around us. At its closest, the 130-foot-wide asteroid gets to the distance of around 40 times that of the Moon. According to the results of orbital analysis, the rock has been following Earth for at least 100 years. We found more than 480 lunar meteorites on our planet. It may mean that pieces of our natural satellite travel through space pretty regularly. And Kamaoalewa might as well just be the first discovered large rock split off the moon as a result of an ancient collision. Now we've already talked about quasi-moons. Let's find out more about asteroids. These space bodies are often called minor planets or planetoids. They're usually rocky leftovers from the early formation of our solar system that occurred around 4.6 billion years ago. They are mainly found in the asteroid belt between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. Asteroids can be very different in size, from tiny dust particles and modestly sized boulders to huge bodies reaching 600 miles across. Asteroids often have irregular shapes, especially smaller ones. At the same time, large space bodies can have more of a spherical shape. Unlike planets, asteroids don't consist of layers. They're made of different kinds of metals and rocks and have no atmosphere. Funnily enough, some asteroids have moons of their own. And there are even asteroid binaries where two asteroids of similar size orbit each other. The asteroid belt located between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter has the largest number of asteroids in our solar system. There are millions of space rocks there of various shapes and sizes. But despite such a huge number of asteroids, they're widespread across the vastness of the cosmos. And if you accidentally wandered into that region, the chances of your spacecraft colliding with an asteroid would be quite low. But even though most asteroids prefer to stay in the asteroid belt, some of them make their way closer to Earth. Those are called near-Earth asteroids. Experts monitor such asteroids because of the potential risk they pose. In the past, they did affect our planet. Think of that large one that most likely wiped dinosaurs off the face of the Earth. NASA and other international space agencies have sent a few missions to research asteroids. Some of them aim to retrieve samples from asteroids and return them to Earth for study. 
Okay, I officially give up on the hope that the moon is made of cheese after all. Wow, not even Gouda. The shiny lunar ball, or a curved banana, or half of a coin, depending on what phase it's in, has different layers inside, just like Earth. One of these layers is called the inner core. About 20 years ago, scientists were observing how the moon rotates. Using that data, they concluded that it had a fluid outer core. But the inner core was hard to study, so they didn't know if it was solid like a rock or molten like a hot liquid. But things are clearer now. Astronomers have collected data from different missions, including the Apollo missions, where astronauts went to the moon and gathered information themselves. Plus, they've used a special technique called seismic data. This method is all about studying how sound waves move through things. Take earthquakes on our planet as an example. When an earthquake happens, it creates waves that travel through the ground. Scientists can detect and analyze these waves to learn more about Earth's interior. The same idea can apply to other objects in our solar system, or planets, or, in this case, the moon. When quakes or moonquakes happen, they generate sound waves. And by carefully listening to and studying these waves, scientists can create a detailed map of what's inside the object. They can figure out things like different layers, what they're made of, and how they're arranged. To check the moon's deep interior, scientists also use something called laser ranging. This method measures the distance between the surface of the Earth and the moon very precisely. And ta-da! Our natural satellite's inner core is a dense, solid ball made of iron, just like Earth's. It's about 310 miles wide, which is nearly 15% the size of the entire moon. Researchers also have stumbled upon evidence that supports the theory that the layer between the moon's surface and its core, called the mantle, has been moving around as the moon evolved over time. This movement is something we call lunar mantle overturn. And it could explain why we find elements rich in iron on the lunar surface. Mantle material ends up being carried upward, and the volcanic rock remains in the moon's crust. Some of the materials in this rock were too dense, like me, so they just sank back through the lighter crust material all the way to the core mantle boundary. It's like a cycle where the moon's mantle material goes up during volcanic activity, carries iron-rich elements to the surface, and then sinks back down. There's another mystery scientists have been trying to solve. What caused the moon's magnetic field to weaken and nearly disappear over time? It seems that now that we know about the iron core and the global mantle overturn, we might get some more answers about the moon's magnetic field. Knowing what the inner core is like can help us better understand the moon's history as well as the history of our entire solar system. Now, one of the theories that's widely accepted about the origin of the moon says there was a massive collision between Earth in its early stages and another mysterious object in our solar system. It's called the Large Impact Theory, and this collision was so strong it ripped off a big chunk of the primitive molten Earth. I mean, not so big compared to what's left. If you put a US nickel next to a green pea, you get a good idea of how big our planet is compared to the moon. Now, this chunk was set into orbit around our planet. And this might have happened about 95 million years after our solar system formed. The object that collided with Earth could have been about 10% the mass of our home planet and roughly the size of Mars. Well, it makes sense, Earth and the Moon do have similar compositions after all. Of course, there are other ideas about how the Moon formed. One says that the gravitational force of our planet captured it. This means that the Moon was just an object innocently passing by when suddenly it got attracted and pulled into Earth's orbit. There's even a hypothesis that Earth stole the Moon from Venus. Ooh. In that case, the Moon shouldn't complain. I guess the view is way better here. So yeah, the Moon and Earth are similar when it comes to rocks and some minerals. But the Moon doesn't have the same atmosphere as our planet. Its atmosphere is thin and consists of some weird gases that include potassium and sodium, which is not something you can find in the atmosphere of Mars, Venus, or Earth. And the rocks on the Moon don't contain water. But that doesn't mean there's no water at all up there. A long time ago, in the 17th century, astronomers saw large, dark spots on the Moon's surface. One of these astronomers thought these spots looked like oceans. 
and he called them maria, which means seas in Latin. Other astronomers also made maps of the moon, and they used the term maria to describe these dark spots. For example, Mare Tranquillitatis translates to Sea of Tranquility, where Apollo 11 made its touchdown. But it seems those dark spots are not actually oceans. They are plains made of hardened lava that erupted long ago. These volcanic eruptions left behind smooth flat areas called basalt plains. In the late 1800s, one sky watcher studied the moon and found it didn't have an atmosphere. Without an atmosphere, there are no clouds and no air to keep water from evaporating. So scientists thought that any water on the moon would just disappear right away. They believed the moon was totally dry. But then, in 1961, one physicist had a different idea. He pointed out there could be water on the moon in special areas called permanently shadowed regions. These are spots on the moon where the sun doesn't shine so they stay dark all the time. Water ice could exist in these dark areas because they're extremely cold and the ice wouldn't evaporate. But when astronauts from the Apollo missions went to the moon, they brought back soil samples, and scientists found no signs of water in them. So everyone went back to thinking that the moon was completely dry. In the 90s, NASA focused on these shadowed craters and found high concentrations of hydrogen which meant there could be ice at the moon's poles. They still weren't certain, so they kept digging and, after a while, found hydrogen trapped inside tiny beads of volcanic glass. Since there are no active volcanoes on the moon today, which means water probably was present on the moon when these volcanoes erupted long ago. Plus, there could be way more water back in the early days of our moon. In 2020, NASA's SOFIA mission showed us what we'd been looking for for a really long time. There is water on the moon, after all. It turns out the water is hidden within the grains of lunar dust or sticking to the surface in the sunlit areas of the moon. So there are no oceans like we have on Earth, but at least there's something. The question remains, how did water even get there? It seems the moon had a chaotic history back at the time when it was forming as probably most of the planets and moons in our solar system. So there is some evidence that water came there from comets hitting its surface back in the old days, or maybe even keeps on coming from those that are slamming into the moon right now. We're talking about a chaotic situation where icy micrometeorites collide with the moon's surface, and dust then makes an even bigger mess when interacting with the solar wind. But we're waiting to find out more about this. Because, as we all know, when you mention water, you also inevitably talk about life. That's why we want to know more, for instance, about all that ice hidden in polar craters on the moon. Maybe it can teach us more about how life developed on Earth. Maybe comets brought all the necessary elements here. Then, what if there are some of those elements stuck in the ice on the moon, too? Hmm. Put on your shades because Mercury is a hotspot. From the surface of this planet, the sun looks three times bigger than it does from Earth, and the light is 11 times brighter. Mercury may spin slower than Earth, but it still knows how to have a good time. One day on this planet lasts a whopping 59 Earth days. But don't worry, a year on Mercury is only 88 Earth days long, so if you want to feel like a centenarian, just divide your age by naught. 0.25 or multiply it by 4. This way, you'll get your approximate Mercurian age. Easy peasy. And let's not forget about Mercury's funky orbit. For every two orbits around the Sun, it spins twice. That means each hemisphere gets a full year of daylight followed by a long night. Time zones would be a mess on this planet, so we'll just stick to GMT. Ugh, did anyone forget to take out the trash? Why does it smell of rotten eggs in here? Uh, sorry, it's because we're on Venus now, and these stinky clouds don't smell like roses. Any planet's day is basically just how long it takes for it to do a full spin on its axis. Well, Venus takes its sweet time with this, way slower than Earth, in fact. So a day on Venus lasts a whopping 243 Earth days, or almost 6,000 hours. Now here's where things get a bit tricky. Because Venus's day is so long, 
We actually use Earth's day as standard for keeping time on the planet. That means there's only one time zone for the whole planet. Seems convenient, huh? Venus's year is about 225 days. So if you were celebrating New Year's Eve on Earth in the year 2000, that would have been Venus's year 3251. So to keep track of time of Venus, we can use the local year made up of 225 Earth days, but every three years or so, there's an extra short year made up of only 224 days. Not that confusing. We have leap years on Earth too, but it works a bit differently. We've made it to planet Earth. Woohoo! How many time zones do we have on this big blue ball? Give me a drum roll. 24. And did you know that we can actually mess with time a little bit? Yup, in about 80 countries, mostly in Europe and North America, we have something called daylight saving time. It's where we move our clocks forward an hour during the summer so we can soak up all that sweet, sweet sunshine. But beware, each country has its own rules about DST. So make sure you don't get caught snoozing when you're supposed to be working. And get this, some regions even have time zones that differ from UTC by half or quarter hour increments. Can you imagine that the moon is getting its own time zone? The European Space Agency announced on Monday that it's time for the moon to have its own synchronized time zone. With more and more countries and private companies planning missions to our lunar neighbor, it's important that we all speak the same language when it comes to timekeeping. Right now, each mission carries Earth's coordinated universal time with it, which is fine when there are only a few missions happening at once. But with dozens of moon missions planned over the next few years, things are going to get tricky. We need a system in place to make sure everyone's on the same page, or we'll end up with different spacecraft out of sync with each other, and nobody wants that kind of chaos in space. Precise timekeeping is super important for communication and navigation, so we need to figure out a way to make sure everyone's on the same page. The ESA hasn't figured out exactly what form this new lunar time zone will take, but they're working on it. Should there be a single organization responsible for keeping lunar time? Or should we let the moon set its own time? And what about more granular time zones based on the sun's position? These are all important questions that need to be answered. When it comes to a day on Mars, it's not too different from a day on Earth. We're talking 24 hours, 39 minutes, and 35 seconds. A Martian year is 1.8 Earth years, which means the Earth year 2000 happened in Martian year 1063. Almost forgot. The Martian year has 668 local days. Phew! We sorted out the Martian calendar, but Mars will need local time zones. Because of its elongated orbit, the difference between summer and winter hours will be significant. Daylight saving time will be a thing on Mars. A year on Jupiter lasts almost 12 Earth years. Yeah, that's like a lifetime in dog years. But don't worry, they've got 12 seasons to keep things interesting. Each almost as long as an Earth year, but a day on Jupiter only lasts 9 hours and 55 minutes. Also, since Jupiter doesn't have a solid surface, the clouds move at different speeds, so two free-floating atmospheric stations could experience different days. Hey, if we lived on Jupiter, we'd be in bad need of some cool app tracking all those things. Anyway, if we ever terraform Jupiter's region, most of the population will still live on Jupiter's moons, because the atmosphere is just too wild. And get this, the moon's revolution periods are connected, so we can use the same day counting system for all of them. On Io, we can have two standard Jovian days in one Earth day. How do we break that down? Well, we could have a minute of 53 seconds and an hour of 103 minutes. Or we could just stick with Earth's minute and hour and have a day that's 21 hours and 13 minutes long. How old are you? I'm 200 days old and you? Sounds odd to you, Earth dweller, but uh, dudes on Saturn count their age in days. A year on Saturn is crazy long, like more than 29 Earth years. Kiddos would only get a fraction of a year, while the oldest folks might get a whopping three years. So to keep track of time on Saturn, we could divide up a Saturnian year into 29 or 30 seasons. Oh, and fun fact, Saturn doesn't even have a solid surface, just rotating clouds that spin at different speeds. But we could still set up some cool research stations or 
helium extraction balloons to float around up there. One Uranian year lasts a whopping 84 Earth years. So, to make things easier, we'll stick to using Earth years for our calculations, and natural Uranian years can be used for special occasions, like reaching one Uranian year old. As Uranus doesn't have a solid surface, the rotation period is all over the place. Only science missions and helium mining companies are brave enough to venture into the atmosphere. And get this, each moon has its own day and date system. Pretty confusing. Most people won't ever celebrate one Neptunian year old. One year on Neptune is like that's way too long for us humans to stick around. But don't worry, we'll still bust out the confetti and party hats for special occasions like when it's been two whole years since the first spaceship hit up Neptune. As for the rest of the time, we'll just use Earth years for all our business needs. Pluto takes a whopping 240 Earth years to orbit the Sun, which is way too long to use as a year in our everyday lives. A day on Pluto is almost like a week on Earth. So, to keep track of time, we're going to divide that into six standard Plutonian days, three of light and three of dark. That means a standard day on Pluto will last slightly more than one Earth day. Now, because Pluto's axis is super tilted, using time zones would be pointless. So we'll just use one time zone for the whole system. Easy peasy. As for the standard Plutonian year, it'll be almost the same as the Earth year, about 343 days. But once in 10 years, we'll throw in an extra day just for kicks. That's all for now. See you on Pluto. Back when Apollo missions were launched, astronauts returning from the moon claimed that moon dust, the gray sand-like dust covering much of the satellite surface, smelled and tasted, yes, they actually tasted it, like gunpowder. But the stuff moon dust is made of is nothing like gunpowder. About half of its composition is silicon dioxide glass from impacts with meteorites. They hit the surface of the moon at incredible speeds. Whoa! The high temperature makes the topsoil fuse into glass, and the impact shatters it right afterwards, creating the gray and clingy dust. The rest of moon dust ingredients are minerals such as iron, calcium, and magnesium, while old-fashioned gunpowder consists mainly of saltpeter, charcoal, and sulfur. In other words, moon dust shouldn't smell like gunpowder, but it does. Besides, when astronauts brought samples of it back to Earth, there was no smell left at all. One explanation could be that the moon is similar, in a way, to Earth's sand deserts, like the Sahara. It's extremely dry and arid. When you sniff the air in a desert, you don't smell anything. But if you get caught in the rain there, the moisture will raise all kinds of odors from the ground that were previously trapped in the dry sand. With moon dust, it might be similar. While on the surface of the moon, it doesn't smell at all. Not that the astronauts could sniff at it wearing their spacesuits, though. But when brought back inside the landing module, the dust came into contact with moisture in the air and started emitting its strange odor. Another reason for this could be a reaction of moon dust to the solar wind. Ionized particles from the sun hit the bare surface of the moon and stay there. There's no thick atmosphere to protect it from those ions, so they travel freely right to the ground. They're very lightweight, so they can fly off and sort of evaporate from the slightest of nudges. And when astronauts took the moon dust samples to the landing module, those particles could have started moving around and giving off the specific smell. This might also explain why the samples didn't keep their odor when brought back to Earth. Since the particles are so light, they might have flown off the samples already in the landing module. And when they were placed in airtight containers, there were little or no ions left on them. Another explanation is that those airtight containers weren't so airtight after all. Moon dust is basically very small crystals with extremely sharp edges. They unexpectedly made tiny cuts in the seals, letting in air and moisture, and so the ionized particles leaked out of the containers. Scientists believe they should study moon dust on the surface of the moon itself to find out everything about its properties. Now, there are hundreds of thousands of craters on the surface of the moon made by falling asteroids, but one of them drew a lot of attention. It turned out to not be just an impact crater, but a tube, looking most like an entrance to a cave system. Scientists found a specific echo pattern that suggested there was a hollow area beneath. They discovered more echo patterns at a couple of places near the hole, so there could be more lunar tubes there. But in this big tube, you could place an entire football field. 
Researchers believe there could be an entire geological wonderland under the surface. It could be a good shelter for astronauts landing on the moon or even be a harbor for a lunar colony. No one ever managed to stay on the moon for more than three days because of the conditions on the satellite. Wide range of temperatures, low atmosphere, no magnetic field would protect life on the surface from things like radiation or solar wind. Astronauts wear spacesuits. They can't protect them over long periods of time, but a lava tube could. When a lava flow cools, it gets a hard crust, which later thickens and creates a roof over that same lava. It continues to flow, but when it stops, the channel can drain, and that's how an empty tube appears. Our planet also has lava tubes, but they're not as big as the one found on the moon. Back in 1178, I wasn't around then, at least five people in England claimed they had seen the moon split into two from its upper tip. It was in the shape of a crescent at the time of the event. When the crack widened, fire started blazing from it, which the single monk who chronicled it described it as a flaming torch sprang up, spewing out fire, hot coals, and sparks. Then the moon started shifting around and pulsating, but soon stopped and turned a slightly darker shade. The event didn't receive much attention from scientists, though, until the second half of the 20th century. Researchers studied the chronicle and figured out there was a huge, 14-mile-wide crater on the surface of the moon at about the spot described in the book. Only a very large asteroid could have left such a scar on the satellite's face. And when they investigated it more closely, they found out it was pretty recent by astronomical standards. In fact, it really could have appeared about 800 years ago. But in that case, millions of fragments from the asteroid and the moon would have hit the Earth as well. And then people would have seen an incredible meteor shower. It would have been very bright, and the memories of it would have definitely been in the archives. But that didn't happen. In addition, many scientists argue that the crater isn't as young as it might seem. The most popular and justified theory is that it's about 1 to 10 million years old. If it had appeared as recently as 800 years ago, parts of the surface of the moon in and around the crater would still have been warm from the impact. The most likely explanation of what really happened back in 1178 is that observers were extremely lucky to see an asteroid falling towards the Earth and burning in our planet's atmosphere. The spectacle would have been incredible, and seen from a proper angle, the burst of the asteroid could have really looked like it was the moon exploding. That would explain why there were so few witnesses of the phenomenon. The right spot to see the show, as they did, was only a couple of miles wide. As for real events on the moon, water and oxygen were unexpectedly discovered on it not long ago. Water might have been brought to the satellite by asteroids hitting its surface, many of them carrying H2O molecules, and those that are left on the moon in tiny amounts after the impact. There's precious little water there, though. By comparison, even the Sahara Desert has more of it than the entire moon. Oxygen is also present as separate molecules floating around, so you still can't breathe on the moon. Solar wind brought them there. Waves of energy from the sun travel at extremely high speeds through space, scrape oxygen from the upper parts of our atmosphere, and carry it further. Eventually, the wind with the oxygen molecules reaches the moon. And that's where something incredible happens. The moon starts rusting. There's plenty of iron in the lunar soil, and when it's exposed to oxygen and water, it naturally rusts. Some parts of the moon have actually already turned slightly reddish. They're regions where there's the highest concentration of molecules. If this process goes on long enough, in the distant future, the moon will look like Mars. It will turn orange-red. Yes, the signature color of Mars came exactly from the corrosion that began there thousands and thousands of years ago, when there were rivers and seas with water and an atmosphere with oxygen. Another unusual phenomenon is the blue and red lights on the moon. They can be seen when it's crescent-shaped. The flashes come and go very quickly, almost like lightning. And in fact, that's what they basically are – electric bursts. Tidal forces are to blame for this. They cause mechanical stress buildup in the rocks. This can produce an electric field, which creates the blue flashes that have surprised many amateur astronomers. But still, there's so far been no green cheese discovered there. Or moon pies, for that matter. Disappointing, I know. About 8 billion inhabitants of planet Earth found out the same terrible news in one day. 
someone saw it on TV. Others heard it on the phone while scrolling through social media or listening to music. Some witnessed this news in a dream while sleeping. Someone's voice said it in all languages to ensure everyone understood it. I have good news and bad news for you. Let's start with the bad news. You're all characters in YouTube videos in which your planet gets into a situation where the moon breaks in half. For the audience, it will be a hypothetical story, but for you, these events will become a reality. The good news is that I was joking. There is no good news. But don't worry, the apocalypse won't start on your planet. Maybe just a little bit. Have a nice day. At first, the entire population panics. Then, a few days later, everyone calms down. Maybe it was a mass hallucination, and the moon will be all right. But at this moment, scientists have discovered the danger. A colossal meteorite is flying towards us from the distant depths of space. This meteorite is super fast and pretty flat, but has sharp edges. Fortunately, it will miss the Earth by a few thousand miles, but the moon won't be that lucky. The meteorite flies through our Earth's only natural satellite directly in the middle. So it passes through the moon, sweeps past our planet, and flies away into distant space. At this moment, all people can't take their eyes off the moon. The meteorite cuts it perfectly in half, gently, clearly, painlessly. So, what shall we do now? Will the Earth survive this? Our satellite breaks into two equal parts, but fortunately, they don't fly away from each other. The moon's great gravity attracts them back like a magnet. Scientists are sure that the parts will connect in a couple of billion years, and the moon will become the same as it used to be. But the coolest thing is that people won't feel any changes. Everyone around the world will celebrate this good news. The voice was wrong. But then another problem appears. A massive meteorite in the form of a shoe is flying from the deepest space to us. It enters our solar system and approaches the Earth at high speed. The space boot crashes into one half of the moon and then flies away. Now the moon is definitely breaking into two parts. The first half remains in the same place. The second one is flying towards us. A small meteor shower begins on Earth because of the falling moon fragments, but it's not so bad. Most of these rocks are burning up in the atmosphere. But almost the entire split-off half is falling apart around the orbit of our planet. It forms a stone belt. Now the Earth is like Saturn. Rotating fragments destroy part of our artificial satellites. Communication and the internet work inconsistently. It takes people a couple of years to restore a stable connection. The International Space Station no longer exists. Luckily, all the astronauts managed to return to Earth before half the moon got to them. So, moon rocks are flying around the planet, and people see half the moon in the sky. Life doesn't change much for the first few days, but those who live on the coast of the seas and oceans notice the consequences. The moon used to influence the tides. It was flying around the Earth and made oceans take an oval shape. There were tides on the side where the moon was closer. There were ebbs on the opposite side, but now this schedule is wrong. Half of the moon attracts less water. Yes, the moon lost half its weight and began approaching the Earth, but its gravitational force has become weaker. Seabirds, many species of fish, sea turtles, and other coastal animals may not survive these changes. Their natural instincts associated with the moon help them determine the time for getting food, breeding, and flying south. For example, tiny turtles expect a strong tide in the morning. They run to the water, but the water doesn't reach them. Turtles can't hide in the ocean in time and become dinner for seagulls. Crabs can't lay eggs because the tide has started earlier than usual. Wolves go mad in the woods. They howl loudly every night and can't stop. The whole natural world can't understand what's going on. The human body is also feeling some discomfort. Many people have low and high blood pressure, and some experience severe headaches. Half of the moon changes the entire ecosystem of the planet. Adapting to new conditions will take several tens, maybe hundreds of years. A couple of weeks pass, and people notice the days are now shorter. The moon always slowed the Earth's rotation and made one day last 24 hours. The Earth is spinning faster now. The night and the morning come earlier than everyone is used to. Earth rotation speed has increased and reduced the number of hours per day to 15. 
people suffer from insomnia or oversleeping. The body needs time to get used to it. Work schedules are changing all over the world. Previously, people came to the office at 9 and left at 6. Now, they arrive at 7 and leave at 2 p.m. Sleep time got shorter, and people are really sad because of this. Progress slows down because the short working time. The technologies of the future are now 20 to 30 years late. Hourly pay remains the same, so bosses now pay less for fewer working hours. The whole moon stabilized the weather and climate on the planet. Look at Mars. It has two small moons. They quickly spin around it and rock Mars around on its axis. As a result, strong winds, sandstorms, and thunderstorms often happen on the red planet. Now the half of the moon that approached us takes the Earth out of stable rotation. This changes the seasonal temperatures in the world. It even gets hotter in hot places. And snowstorms are raging in cold regions. There are short, massive downpours instead of sunny weather. A typical breeze can grow into a hurricane and small waves into a tsunami. The seasons are changing faster now. Winters are colder and summers are hotter. Changing the rotation of the planet affects the Earth's magnetic field. Since the compass and navigation systems are unstable now, we need to recalculate where the north and south are. Birds can't fly south to wait out the winter since they don't know what direction to fly. Their inner compass is broken. Several hundred years have passed. People are entirely accustomed to the new conditions on Earth. New species of animals and fish have appeared. Birds can navigate the sky by the moon again. The planet's economy has been restored. Hourly wages have become higher. People now get enough sleep from 5 to 6 hours a day and work for 4 to 5 hours. The reduction of day and night has also affected the entertainment industry. Movies now last one hour. One episode of some TV series lasts 30 minutes. Life goes faster. An average person now lives to be 96 years old. In fact, the passage of time hasn't changed at all. Its calculus did. Several thousand years have passed. People look different now. Now they have big eyes that absorb more light. Half of the moon doesn't shine as bright as the whole thing, so the nights have become darker. It took the human eye a couple of thousand years to develop the ability to see clearly in this new dark. Animals need to navigate better in these conditions, so their eyes have become larger and more sensitive. During all this time, people have cleared the orbit of moon rocks. Several space stations fly around our planet. And again, people hear this strange voice that once told them that they were all characters in one hypothetical YouTube video. This time, the voice says, Your story ends because the video ends. I'm sorry. Good night. Sometimes, when you look at the moon, you see a face smiling down at you from the moon's surface. Of course, this is an illusion, but many people see it, and that's because its surface is shaped by some sort of lunar seas and highlands. From our point of view, we see these as light and dark patches. These seas are dark parts, and large hardened lava plains formed because of volcanic eruptions that happened a long, long time ago. The light regions are actually the mountains and the highlands. And people all around the globe see these lunar patches as a smiling face or even some other shapes. Our brain tends to play with things of this nature, and that's a phenomenon called pareidolia. It's when you see familiar faces and shapes, even though they're not actually there, similar to how you can see a face in a slice of toast or shapes while watching the clouds. And in the northern hemisphere, people see a face in those different lunar seas. The eyes are the sea of serenity and rain, the sea of clouds represents his mouth, while the seas of islands and vapors form his nose. But that's just one way to interpret this picture. And that mostly works in the northern hemisphere. If you live in the southern hemisphere, you see in the moon the other way up. When they look at the moon, some see a person that looks like they're carrying a bundle of sticks. Or there's the shape of a woman. She wears her hair up and it has two jewels in it. And they see the left side of her face in profile. One of the craters is reminiscent of a shining diamond which, it seems, she's wearing around her neck. In some places, people may see the shape of a rabbit, whereas people from the Pacific Northwest in America even have a story about the toad they see when looking at the moon. The story says there was a wolf that fell in love with a toad, 
And the toad didn't quite trust the wolf since it wanted to escape and didn't know where. It simply made one huge leap and landed on the moon. Now, do other planets have beautiful rainbows like we do? The ingredients for that are raindrops and sunlight. At the moment, we don't know of a planet with liquid water on its surface, and none have enough water in their atmosphere to make it rain. But droplets of some other liquid could refract light coming from the sun and spread it out into various colors. Titan is one of Saturn's moons, and the atmosphere there is rich in droplets of liquid methane, which probably form rain. The atmosphere on Titan is very hazy. That means that direct sunlight is not that common, but there's still a slight chance we could catch methane rainbows someday. If they really exist, they'd be similar to rainbows on Earth, but they'd be a bit broader because methane refracts light differently than water. There's a similar thing on Venus called glory. Scientists caught pictures of this optical phenomenon of sunlight falling on sulfuric acid droplets, similar to a rainbow. Jupiter is insanely big, around 11 times wider than Earth. Not only that, our planet is twice as small as its great red spot, the raging storm that's been present on the planet for more than a century. Now, we owe Jupiter a lot. Its radiation is a thousand times stronger than the lethal level for us, and the gravitational force is so powerful that it actually protects our planet from collisions. In some other planetary systems, Giant planets like Jupiter can move around and migrate from the place where they were originally formed. They spiral inward and get closer to their stars. When they move around, they can cause a lot of trouble. When they get closer to their stars, they can swallow and destroy some innocent small planets or other celestial bodies that stand in their way. But if these giants remain far away from their stars, they serve as guardians of the planetary system. They protect the planets in the inner orbits and allow them to circle around a central star. Jupiter got the nickname Vacuum Cleaner of the Solar System because it can eat up any comet or asteroid that comes close enough. It can also change their orbits and kick them out so they can't come back for a very, very long time. That way, Jupiter protects the inner planets, although sometimes it accidentally sends asteroids or comets into them, causing collisions like maybe the one that made the dinosaurs extinct 65 million years ago. Now, Saturn's rings are the most famous ones in our solar system. They are far-reaching, colorful, and highly visible. You can even see them using a backyard telescope. But some other ice and gas giants also have them too, like Uranus. It has the second most interesting set of rings in our solar system. There are 13 rings, and they're all made of very dark particles that are different sizes. They're most likely young, way younger than Uranus itself. One theory says high-speed impacts shattered one or more moons, and this may have been the matter these rings are formed of. There were way more particles of debris, but only some survived, and today are forming stable zones around Uranus, known as rings. Now, our planet lost 60% of its atmosphere when there was an asteroid impact that, as one theory says, probably created the moon. The collision between Earth and a Mars-sized rock happened over 4 billion years ago. The debris from all that collected in an orbit around our planet eventually formed the moon. Now, Venus is home to at least 37 volcanoes that were active recently, which is the first evidence that showed its interior is still geologically active. Previous research discovered that the planet's interior was warm, plus there were ring-like structures. Plumes of extremely hot material deep inside Venus rise through the mantle layer, and that's how these structures form. It's like how plumes form the volcanic areas of the Hawaiian Islands. But scientists think they were just a result of some ancient activities. They believe Venus has cooled enough and drastically slowed down geological activities in its interior by hardening the crust so much that all of the warm materials from deep inside can't get out to the surface. Speaking of volcanic eruptions, Jupiter's moon Io also has them. Our moon is pretty peaceful, but Io has hundreds of volcanoes, and it took the title of the most active moon in our solar system when it comes to volcanoes. If you could go there, you'd see plumes of sulfur that reach up to 190 miles into its atmosphere. 
Volcanoes there emit one ton of particles and gases into space near Jupiter, its parent planet, every second. This could be because Jupiter's strong magnetic field and gravitational force, Io's interior tenses up and relaxes as it orbits Jupiter, and gets closer to it and farther away from it, which generates huge amounts of energy, enough for volcanic activity. There are billions of comets in our solar system. Most of them are in the Oort cloud and the Kuiper belt. A comet generally consists of rock and ice, at least until it gets closer to the sun. Then its exterior turns into a cloud of dust and gas. And that's why comets have their specific tails. Pluto's unique surface is a series of domes, peaks, and troughs on the planet's landscape, which may have been formed because of its many large ice volcanoes. Neither erosion nor some other geological activity has done that much, but its ice volcanoes actually push icy material up to the surface. There are also a couple of craters in this area of the hemisphere called New Horizons. Asteroid impacts probably caused these. Plus, these craters aren't that geologically old. Also, the interior of Pluto probably retained heat, which enabled matter rich in water and ice to deposit onto the surface. And those specific structures I mentioned before could have formed because the water was rising up from the interior of the planet and ended up being rapidly frozen because temperatures on Pluto are extremely low, in addition to atmospheric pressures. Uranus is the second least dense planet in our solar system. The least dense one is Saturn. Now, even though Saturn is 14 and a half times as massive as our planet, it's still less dense than water. This means that Saturn would float in a pool if it was more than 37,000 miles wide, so the planet would have enough space to even be in there. Whoa, that's a big pool. Now back to Uranus. Since its density level is so low, you probably experience less than 90% of its gravity, assuming you could even set foot on its cloud tops. Now Mars has pretty crazy dust storms, the biggest ones in our solar system, actually. They can blanket the whole planet and last for months, One theory says these huge storms start because dust particles absorb sunlight and warm the atmosphere of the red planet. Warm pockets of air form, and they start flowing toward colder areas. This generates winds. These powerful winds lift more and more dust off the ground. This again heats the planet's atmosphere, creates more wind, and kicks up even more dust. Wow, better have a broom handy. Maybe even two. The space crew had been getting ready for the launch for over three years. The preparations for landing on the strange planet included gathering and studying rock samples in the Grand Canyon, exploring ancient volcano formations in the Nevada National Security Site, and looking into gas and lava vents, lava lakes, and pit craters in various locations in Hawaii. To be able to resist microgravity conditions, they learned how to walk obliquely by being strapped and suspended sideways and trying to move along walls. They had to test their limits through intensive diet and sleep regimens to make sure they'd be safe in outer space. It took them three days, three hours, and 49 minutes to reach the surface of this new world in a place called the Sea of Tranquility. They could have gone for the Ocean of Storms or the Central Bay, but they chose this place to land because it had good visibility and it was relatively smooth and easily reachable with as little propellant as possible. One of the first things they noticed when they got there was that, well, the place kind of smelled. This may sound like the beginning of a science fiction novel, but it's actually the true story about how the Apollo 11 mission landed on the moon on July 20th, 1969. Since then, the moon has had 12 human visitors to this day. We think of it as our neighboring space buddy, but there's still much we don't know about this mysterious satellite. And that should come as no surprise, since the moon is actually always showing us the same face. That is because the Earth and its only permanent natural satellite are in synchronous rotation, which makes us think it's always permanently still. The truth is, it's not in a fixed position, and it is actually moving further and further away from the Earth each year by 1.5 inches. Believe it or not, the Earth and the moon although being 238,855 miles apart, deeply influence each other. While the moon is partially responsible for the tides of the seas and oceans on our planet's surface, our Earth is actually to blame for movement on the moon. They're called moonquakes, 
and they last way longer than earthquakes, some of them up to half an hour. It may look perfectly round to us on a warm summer's night, but the moon is actually oval. The lemon-like shape is caused by the Earth's gravitational pull. Our moon features more than footprints when it comes to traces of humans. In 1969, American astronauts left many objects on the surface of our satellite, such as two golf balls, a drawing by famous artist Andy Warhol, and a message from Queen Elizabeth II herself. One of the last people to walk on the moon to this day, an astronaut named Eugene Cernan, scribbled his daughter's initials on the moon's surface in 1972. Since it appears there's no wind or any other type of weather change there, the letters TDC could remain there permanently. It's actually possible to be allergic to the moon. Harrison Jack Schmidt, an astronaut from the Apollo 17 mission, spent some time in a valley in the Sea of Serenity, then climbed back into the crew's lunar module, but had some moon dust on him. Just as he removed his spacesuit, he got red eyes, sneezing fits, and other allergic reactions that lasted two hours. Since it's so close to us, we've established that the moon has a time zone of its own. We call it the Lunar Standard Time, but it doesn't correspond to time on Earth. To get an equivalent, the explanation is a bit more complex, but in simple terms, a year on the moon is split up into 12 days, each one about as long as a month on Earth. Each one of these days got its name after a different astronaut who has walked on the moon. The start date of this calendar coincides with the moment Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. So, the lunar year one, day one, began on July 21st, 1969 at 2.56.15 Universal Time. Since the moon has a very thin atmosphere, it has some pretty crazy temperatures, both hot and cold. They can go up to 200 degrees Fahrenheit. Over by the moon's poles, however, the temperature is always at around minus 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Humans have tried to trace the connection between our natural satellite and the Earth for as long as we can remember, coming up with words to explain why the moon's existence influences us so. In the Middle Ages, scientists and philosophers thought that during a full moon, some people were more likely to experience different health conditions. Because they saw this inexplicable connection to the full moon, People with these symptoms were named lunatics, or at times, literally, moonsick. People are not the only creatures living on Earth that are affected by moon cycles. Dog owners are 28% more likely to take their pet to vet emergency rooms during the full moon. You may think that's the reason why wolves have this preference for howling at a full moon, more so in popular culture. But scientists haven't been able to find any connection between wolf behavior and the lunar cycles, so it might as well just be a myth. The largest known crater in our solar system is also found on our moon and is called the South Pole Aitken. This giant formation is located on the far side of the moon and measures 1,550 miles in diameter. One of the many things we've yet to fully understand about our satellite is the unusual flashes of light that can sometimes be seen on its surface. Scientists have named these outbursts transient lunar phenomena or TLP in short, and they have been seen all over the world for centuries. One of the first instances of TLP dates back to 1178, when monks from Canterbury claimed to have seen a flaming torch on the surface of the moon after the sun had set. TLP does not simply mean light flashes. Reports also have detailed other unusual events, such as gas-like mists, reddish, green, blue, or violet colorations, or even the darkening of certain locations on the moon. Is something strange happening with our moon? Is it the beginning, or did we just start noticing it with the newer space study equipment we have nowadays? There are a lot of different theories that scientists have developed trying to piece together what can be causing these events. The unusual flashes on the moon can be caused by anything from meteoric impacts to electrostatic activity. It's difficult to pinpoint the explanation for each event since most of these episodes are recalled either by a single observer on Earth or from a single location. The fact that there is noticeable seismic activity on the moon can also explain why we can sometimes see unusual flashes of light on the surface of our satellite. When the moon's surface moves, it can cause different light reflecting gases to erupt, which can explain luminous developments. Some scientists have even suggested that residual geologic activity may also be the cause. 
This is all the more shocking, given that we've always looked at the moon as a lifeless world. Did you ever notice that our moon can change its color? There are actually many scientific explanations for that. The moon appears to be a brown-tinted gray when you look upon it from outside of the Earth's atmosphere. When gazed upon from the Earth's surface, the moon appears to change color depending on various phenomena. The moon seen near the horizon will most likely be yellow or red-tinted. The rarer, blue-colored moon indicates that you're looking at our satellite through an atmosphere carrying larger dust particles. The moon can even appear purple at times, but what causes this specific hue is still up for debate. The fact that we don't know exactly if or how much water there is on the moon's surface is not the main reason why we aren't already building houses up there. It seems that radiation actually has a lot more to do with it. Recent studies have shown that the moon's surface has a radiation rate 5 to 10 times higher than that you experience on a transatlantic passenger flight. That also means it's 200 times higher than the rate on the Earth's surface. In future lunar explorations, like the Artemis project for example, scientists need to take this into consideration not to expose the astronauts. Named after Artemis, Apollo's sister, this program aims not only to place astronauts on the lunar surface in the future, but also to build some sort of an establishment there to study the moon in safe conditions. While the project started in 2017, the first planned mission is set for launch in summer 2022, with an estimated duration of 25 days. The space object with no crew on board is planned to reach lunar orbit and safely return with sufficient data for the next four-person mission scheduled for May 2024. Artemis 3, 4, and 5 are expected to be launched in 2025, 2026, and 2027 respectively, each with a planned duration of approximately 30 days. Now, you wake up one morning and watch the news while having your morning coffee. They did it again! Those scientists! The news anchor yells on the TV. A report was released a few days ago that the moon is moving further away from Earth's orbit. Its distance extends 2 inches per year. Over the past 2,000 years, it's drifted a total of 260 feet. This isn't too daunting of a distance, but the news has still made people panicked and concerned. They rally together around the planet, uniting to try and stop the moon from escaping Earth's orbit, even though it won't actually leave the orbit for over a billion years. But everyone was focused on the past benefits of the moon. It's obvious life on Earth as we know it wouldn't have evolved without its existence. The moon is controlling the tides and the molecules in the atmosphere. Without it, humans, in particular, wouldn't have evolved. So, with an appreciation of the moon, the top brass ordered the best scientists to come up with a solution to push the moon closer towards the Earth. A giant thruster engine was built on the dark side of the moon. It was ignited, and the thrusts tried to push forward, but the startup power wasn't strong enough to push the moon. Instead, it tilted the moon's axis, rotating it slowly. As the moon rotated, the scientists hurried to turn it off before the engine reached its full power as it was headed off course. The brass didn't accept this and ordered them to continue with the objective. The scientists insisted the math wasn't correct and didn't know exactly what may occur. Their concerns were ignored, and they watched as the engine's power increased. The engine slowly pushed the moon, the distance reducing. But as it was provided at the wrong moment, the angle it was aimed at would provide complications. The thrust and gravity from the Earth ensured the moon followed the orbit at a reduced distance. But with the combination of the initial thrust on an indirect angle, the moon was directed away from the Earth, quickly moving further off its trajectory on a path to leave the orbit altogether. As you finish your breakfast and turn the TV off, you go outside to look at the moon. It sits high above, seemingly fine. Surely, the news anchor was just exaggerating. You go to work. The issues of the moon are now just an afterthought. Even if it was true, how could it possibly affect your day? The morning feels normal, just another day at the office, as it turns out. During your lunch break, you head into town and notice on your way that the wind is picking up, getting stronger and colder. 
it must be a storm approaching. You quickly check on the moon. It appears smaller, about half the size of what it was this morning. But it's midday, so it's supposed to be that size, isn't it? After you finish your meal at the restaurant, you leave to find it's becoming darker. The wind is much stronger than earlier, but there are no storm clouds in the sky. People in the streets are pointing towards the sky, shocked at something, probably an eclipse. As people begin running in the streets frantically, you look above and can't see the moon. Confused by everything, you decide to head home for the day. When you arrive home, you turn on the TV. The news anchor, who is now more serious than earlier, explains that the moon has left the Earth's orbit altogether and is flying off somewhere into space. The loss of the moon means the daily cycle has changed. Now, there are only 6 to 12 hours of sunlight a day, and over a thousand days per year. I only have to work half as much, you say excitedly, pumping your arms in the air. The lack of the moon creates a completely different world. The pull of the moon's gravity is what keeps the Earth in a place at 23.5 degrees angle, ensuring the weather patterns and normal days that we're accustomed to. Baffled by all the scientific information, you go outside to just confirm you aren't being pranked. The shorter working week seems too good to be true. As you look out into the sky, you notice the stars are brighter than you have ever seen. You can clearly see the outline of the Milky Way's arms. The stars are far more numerous than you remember, with Venus glowing far brighter than them all. It's a beautiful sight, but you're not sure whether a clearer night sky was worth the moon's removal. You have never been interested in astronomy. You decide to go to bed. It's a good idea to adjust to the new night and day cycle. You set your alarm for two hours. That should be enough, you say to yourself happily. Tomorrow is Saturday, after all. You need to get up early to go surfing. Gotta catch those high tide waves. You wake up, get your things together, and drive to the beach. The news on the radio explains some issues about how the Earth is now more defenseless to asteroids without the moon. Then they talk about some issues with the tides. Something about how the tide is now one-third the size it used to be before. You're unsure how this could affect the waves. Maybe it means they will be larger. You park at the beach, grab your board, and look towards where the surf should be. It should be high tide. But the sea is somehow a lot further away than normal. You shrug off the hurdle of having to walk towards the water. After a long, enthusiastic walk toward the gnarly waves, your mood changes as you approach, staring blankly at the tiny waves. Upset, you head home. While driving, you listen to the news and pay more attention to the information provided. In place of structured seasons, there are only erratic weather patterns. Winds are faster and stronger, creating more powerful storms. And in some places, there are just stagnant conditions. The equator is no longer always warm. The poles aren't constantly cold. The depths of water shrink. Tides only adjust to the sun's gravity, reduced to a third of the pre-moon depths. Throughout the world, the seas change in altitude, shrinking at the poles, and the bulge of water around the equator shifts. The moon regulated the tides and provided the periodic changes that were a key element to assisting with life on Earth. Aquatic life forms are displaced within shallows worldwide. Life cycles of important microbial life have been upset. You couldn't imagine that something as simple as a change in the tides could be so important to billions of life forms. Water and precipitation, which is distributed across the globe, cannot provide sustenance where they did before. The weather has become more extreme hotter for longer periods, and colder for other parts of the Earth. Over time, some thousands of years in the future, dry deserts will transition into ice ages. These intense changes disrupt the natural order of all things for life on Earth. Not only did the moon control the tides and weather, but it used to pull molecules within the atmosphere as it moved. The now constant movement disrupts molecules creating barriers for future evolution. 
You arrive home upset after learning the disheartening news. Not only will you never be able to surf again, but all life on Earth will change. An age of devolution has begun. Over the next year, flora and fauna change to adjust to this new world. Migratory animals that would travel toward greener pastures find nothing at all. Birds are completely confused, with no end to the change in seasons. Hibernating animals delve in and out of their shelters at the incorrect times, and vegetation struggles to grow at the lack of sunlight. Nocturnal animals cannot see without guided assistance from the reflection of the moon. Although Venus is the brightest source of light when it's dark, it's only a thousandth of a fraction as bright as the moon was. Predatory animals that hunt during the night are not capable of finding their prey, providing an opportunity for smaller animals to thrive. Although life on Earth has changed, it will continue to exist. But the sudden adjustments will become a test for all walks of life. Over time, it will be very interesting to see what species have adapted and evolved. A world where rats and mice would be more prominent due to their adaptive capabilities could create a new dominant species to emerge. In millions of years of evolution, their descendants will primarily flourish. We could see buffalo-sized mouse herbivores crossing the plains and tiger-sized rats roaming within the jungles. Tree-faring mice with long arms may swing amongst the branches. Others will probably move to the seas in place of mammals to feed upon aquatic life. Wide-eyed predatory rats may occur to have similar traits to bats, with echolocation, becoming the conquerors of pitch-black nights. All the new species that will emerge, undoubtedly, will continue to be monitored by humans, wherever we may be.